presence of a quorum of the Amherst School Committee and calling to order the meeting at on Tuesday, September 21st at 6.34 p.m. Uh, we'll begin with roll call attendance. Please state present when I call your name. Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. And McDonald present. Um, and we have uh, many others from the community that um, are joining for the public forum when it begins um, later. Uh, and I just ask to, just as another reminder for everybody to stay muted um, until you're called on. We'll um, begin with um, our first item is um, approval of the minutes. Um, and those are the minutes from our meeting on August 31st, which are attached to the agenda item in board docs. Did anybody have any edits? I'll start. I noticed that um, in several places um, in the topic related to the uh, elementary school building project that the chair of the building committee's name is um, spelled, is, uh, spelled incorrectly. It's S-C-H-O-E-N. Um, and it's spelled as S-H-A-N-E in the minutes. So I'm guessing that you could do a global replace um, for that to catch all the multiple places where that was. That was all that I noted. Did anybody have any other edits? Mr. Dunley? Just want to note they're really excellent drafted minutes. I uh, appreciate the uh, detail and organization from our new recorder. I will second that. Very thorough, thank you. Um, so with that, I'll move that we approve the minutes um, as, as amended from August 31st. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald and seconded by Harrington. We'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously. Um, next up, we have public comment. Um, there is a very large document um, attached to this item. Um, I will note um, that the last comment in that document is about 14 pages, if not a little bit more than that. So um, per our uh, public comment policy, um, no speaker will have more than three minutes to speak. Um, the, we do have one voice comment, um, but as we scroll through, um, I, will, I will scroll through slowly um, and limit the, the, the extra long ones to three minutes on screen. Um, and for the public, that final document is posted in board docs, so you may read along at home um, if you can't see it on screen very well. So we'll start with the, the voice comment. Hi, Jimmy Dion, uh, resident of Amherst um, and parent of a fifth and second graders at Fort River. I'd like to make three points. First, I vigorously support the school building project. I know as well as anyone about the space limits and building defects of Fort River and Wildwood. My fifth graders quote classroom is a converted cafeteria. So I fully support construction of a new building ASAP. Second, I am less enthusiastic about placing sixth graders in middle school from a child development perspective. We all know how delicate the tween years are. You have a very wide range of maturity. To place children who may have just turned 11 in August in the same school as adolescents turning 14 with all the complex questions around sexuality, peer pressure, drug use, gives many of us pause. I heard a lot of talk about possible benefits of middle school, like enhanced academic activities. I haven't heard any of the details though. And when you look at the research on this question, the literature is very clear. Sixth graders do better in elementary school than in middle school. Multiple well-designed studies from Duke and Columbia, Harvard show worse behavioral and academic outcomes for sixth graders placed in middle school versus elementary school. There's never been a study that's shown any academic or social emotional benefits from moving sixth graders to the middle school. 
But given the situation we're in, I don't see any realistic way around moving them. I'm sure most kids will do fine in the end, but let's be honest with ourselves. We're asking the fifth graders to make a kind of sacrifice on behalf of future K-5 to students. The move is purely driven by the need for physical space, not because there's some unaddressed academic or social emotional need faced by fifth graders. I get the need for space, but a school is more than a physical space. Which brings me to my third point. To make this sacrifice fair, the current fifth graders deserve the most careful academic and emotional preparation for a successful life in middle school. Also, the fourth graders will be fifth graders next year. This is a disruptive process that simply cannot be rushed. Add this to the disruption caused by COVID and the cut short their elementary school experience by a year seemed unfair. This should not be sprung on the current fifth grade graders partway through the uh, fifth graders partway through the school year. They began the school year after missing over three months of third grade and nearly the entire fourth grade year. They came in expecting two more years of elementary school and they deserve it. I'm not against new programs. I know the district can do a good job with new programs. My second grader was in the first coming out of kindergarten has been very successful. But the planning that went into that program took over two years. It was not suddenly announced partway through a school year and crammed into nine months. My message to the school committee is move the sixth graders if you must. Um, as mentioned, um, uh, comments are limited to three minutes. Um, I am having an error with my browser and trying to share. I'm going to try again. Um, let's see if that works. Yep. Okay. Phew. Folks able to see that?
So as mentioned, this document is posted um, on the board docs uh, agenda item for public comment. Um, we uh, there is many more pages to that last comment um, that uh, that are all available on online um, in the agenda. I will also note that we've received a high volume of email um, that was not labeled specifically as public comment, and so those were not uh, included in here. Um, any of those that came in that looked like they were intended or um, to be shared and were shared only with me, I did forward on to the committee members, including a, a couple that came in after the three o'clock deadline. Um, for any others um, that are specifically related to the Amherst School Committee decision on October 5th, um, you're welcome to continue to send us email, and if you would like it to include that in public comment for that meeting on October 5th, um, please do label that as such. Uh, I am now going to move on to our next item, which is the superintendent's update. And for that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Morris. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I think maybe just because there are a number there are people on this call. Um, do you mind if I just, either of us could just lay out the, the agenda, because I think some people are raising their hand and, and maybe unclear of the format of when we're going to get to the public forum and all. Um, I can do it or you can do whatever you like. I'd be happy to do it. Um, uh, for those, uh, I, I did talk about it before we actually opened the meeting, but we, um, we have a few more procedural items um, on our agenda. The public forum is scheduled to begin as our first item up in our new and continuing business. Um, so we first will hear um, a superintendent's update. If you're following along on board docs, the agenda, um, superintendent's update, I will have a brief, share a brief chair's update. And then there's a, a few couple minutes for any announcements from other school committee members. Um, and at that point, we'll move into a presentation um, from Dr. Morris on the possible move to uh, of sixth grade to middle school. At that point, we'll open it up for uh, uh, public participation in the forum. Um, and it's great that um, you found the raise hand function. I do, do believe that um, whatever order folks click on that raise hand is the order that you will be in in the in the queue, so to speak. So, um, so um, either I or Dr. Morris will call on you in the order that the hands are raised. Um, but please use that as a as the mechanism, verse, and we'll um, ask you to unmute yourself when it's your turn to talk. Thank you very much. I just want to make sure everyone was clear on that because I yeah, think everyone was on the call the first time you shared that. Um, so sorry to ask you to do that. I'll keep my update as brief as possible given the interest in some of the agenda items in the public forum. Um, it's Latino Heritage Month. Uh, it runs from September 15th to October 15th each year, um, based on the independence that happened around that time for a number of Latin American countries. Uh, there's a large number of ways that the district is honoring and celebrating the month. Uh, Thursday, the weather keeps looking slightly better, so we're, we'll make a decision tomorrow, but I believe we'll hold it to Thursday morning. We're going to have uh, an event, uh, as we have the last couple years, uh, with the exception of last year, at uh, Town Hall with the flag raising, which is a long-standing tradition in the community. Uh, Town Manager Bachman and myself will, will briefly speak. Dr. Guevara, who is the head of our family center, uh, has done incredible amount of work. We'll have, uh, again, weather permitting some music. The former mayor of San Juan will be joining us and we'll be putting the flag, uh, the actual flag that was raised after Hurricane Maria, sorry, um, in Puerto Rico. So it's a particularly special event this year. Um, so uh, in addition to that particular event, all of our schools are doing a number of uh, different um, educational activities uh, within their classrooms and within their schools, including uh, uh, you know, assemblies, um, you know, educational books. Our librarians have been fabulous about making sure our staff have uh, books to celebrate um, different aspects of the month because let's, you know, there is no one thing, right? It's, it's many, many countries in Latin America. So I want to thank everyone for their work on that. Uh, second, I want to share the open house schedule. Crocker Farm will be the 14th of October as well as Wildwood and Fort River will be the 13th of October. Uh, and this year it would be live synchronous, but virtual, um, just from a health and safety perspective, we're doing that. But unlike last year, which was more uh, pre-taped videos, this will be live and virtual and allow for two-way communication. More details on a specific times and grade levels, all that will come directly from building principals. Um, 
I want to, uh, you know, and I'm going to write about this, I believe, on Friday in the update, just really thank staff. Um, it's, they're doing incredible work for the first few weeks, getting up, everything up and running with all of our students back. It's also incredibly challenging work, um, you know, and I do think it's worth, you know, something I'll ask people to do is thank a bus driver, thank a paraeducator, thank a teacher. You know, I rarely give homework to members of the community, but I do think uh, the work that's happening, you know, it's like, you know, I wrote an email to staff this week, uh, yesterday, you know, both things are true. The work is incredibly challenging and it's incredible, incredibly important to our students and our community. And both things can be true, but I, I do think the more we celebrate our staff members, it goes a long way in terms of morale and it's well-deserved. So just want to note that and, and just encourage folks, since there's a lot of people probably watching this call, uh, I'll use a little little bit of that uh, privilege I have to be speaking to a large audience tonight to, to really make sure that we're thanking the people who are doing, um, you know, teaching and, and working during a pandemic is, is no easy gig and people are doing a great job of it in all of our three elementary schools. Um, I'll briefly mention MCAS scores came out and publicly released today. Uh, our um, our uh, scores were uh, remarkably good given the year, the weird year that we had. Uh, I think there's a number of factors that go into that, but are, you know, relevant to my prior point, you know, the staff members really rose to the challenge um, and uh, you know, I think deserve a lot of praise and how they took on distance learning and virtual education in, in really innovative ways. So uh, I also wrote an email to my leadership team that I was really clear, you know, MCAS is not something we focus on tremendously each year, and we're not going to do that again just because the scores happen to be, you know, well above the state average um, for compared to 2019, the last time MCAS was taken. Uh, it, it's it's going to be self-serving of us to uh, make a big deal now when it, we don't make a big deal other years. But I just I think it's an acknowledge. I want to acknowledge the hard work of staff in an incredibly challenging year last year, particularly how how wonderfully they took on something they hadn't done before, which was uh, teaching on a computer. So uh, kudos to them, kudos to the families and students for persevering through a very challenging time. Um, we now have up and running our Binex uh, testing, which is a 15 minute rapid test for anyone who's symptomatic, staff member or student during the school day. Um, we had it running last year, the state changed vendors. That's been a choppy transition for many districts, us included. Uh, but we're glad to have that. It also allows us to have the test and stay strategy for students who are close contacts who are asymptomatic. Uh, so that's great. Thanks to Robin Supernaut and all the nurses for that. We are still not uh, at a place of implementing the pool testing. The vendor's uh, contact for our area um, is no longer working at that organization. We found that out yesterday. So we were making good progress and we're stymied a little bit. Um, us, you know, Lexington superintendent wrote a long email about it. Last night, we're far from the only district. So it is frustrating. Know that our nurses are doing everything possible, but you know, until the vendor is able to, the state appointed vendor is able to support us in that, we are limited in our control. Um, but really glad to have the Binex up and running and our nurses have that ready. It was very successful last year as well. Um, I also wanna thank everyone, everyone in the community for the adjustment to the start time. Um, you know, If it wasn't for the pandemic, we'd be talking about, oh my God, school starts earlier and ends earlier and all those things. but. Um, it's went incredibly smoothly, and that's inclusive of, you know, transportation um, in, in challenging times, uh, managing that, but also families, students, and staff are making that adjustment. So thank you. I know it's making a huge impact, positive impact at the region, uh, at the secondary schools, but it, it meant an adjustment at the elementary. I appreciate everyone uh, rolling with it. Our uh, band driver recruitment, we are making some progress uh, in that area. We had a number of people in for interviews this Nope, last week, excuse me, and you know some some different some licensing issues to to work through with the state because there are uh, rightfully lots of licensing rules and regulations. But I think in the next couple of weeks we'll have uh, significantly more van drivers than we have right now, which will ease some of the burden. We are still looking for bus drivers. We're living not quite as successful as recruitment of, of bus drivers, but we're doing everything possible uh, along that dimension. Our current vaccine rate at the elementary level of staff is uh, well over 85% um, for all staff members at the elementary level. So we do have that information and um, that compares favorably to some of our other communities. Um, as I've said before, I'm pro-vaccine. Um, I think it's a good thing and it's keeping us safe and really happy to have those high numbers. Uh, like many people, I was heartened to see uh, at least the initial read on Pfizer's five to 11 year old um, data and potential timeline for um, emergency youth authorization. We've already been in contact with the town health department about the potential of doing school-based clinics 
for families who are interested uh, sometime when it becomes uh, accepted, which, you know, the estimates I'm seeing are between Halloween and Veterans Day is kind of what people are anticipating. No one really knows, but I think it's that's that's what I'm seeing experts say. So we're already having conversations with the town about doing clinics because we know that for some families getting to uh, getting to a location where there are vaccines uh, may be a challenge. So more soon on that as we get more information on the timeline from the FDA and CDC and Pfizer, but we are anticipating being able to offer on-site vaccines for families who are interested for their children. Um, and still work on details of how families can come because the kids are little and they may want their parents uh, there with them. So working on those details, but we want to make it as, as accessible for families as possible. Uh, I think my last piece is just uh, a plug. We have our wellness committee meeting again. It's co-chaired by our school nutrition director, Michael Gallo-O'Connell, and our nurse manager, Robin Supernot. Uh, meets multiple times over the course of the year. Um, it was in the newsletter last week, but it's really important. We want to have lots of voices in to think about wellness, um, uh, physical wellness, but also other wellness as well. And it, it's a group that provides recommendations for me and I bring them to school committee from time to time. Uh, they were very supportive of the move for our food service to go in-house, which I think looking back feels uh, very much like the right decision. So if anyone's interested in that, uh, you can certainly get in touch with me directly if my email comes up uh, easier, but Debbie Westmoreland um, also can send that information along. And that's my update for the evening. Thank you. Um, on that last item, uh, Dr. Morris, is there any um, specific uh, credentials, requirements, characteristics of um, community members that, um, uh, in order to become a member of the Wellness Committee? Someone who's interested in, in child wellness. Yeah, there's no resumes required or anything like that. It's actually just, it's truly interest-based. Um, and, uh, you know, we welcome anyone who has the capacity and is willing to dedicate their time uh, to that effort. Uh, does meet, um, try to, they try to do different times of day, but, you know, we are going to do a virtual meeting, which I think hopefully opens up access for folks because um, they could take time, you know, if they're at work or they're working from home. Uh, it doesn't need to be a physical uh, meeting. And I think hopefully that provides more, um, again, more access for anyone interested. Any other questions from the committee for the superintendent? Ms. Spitzer. I'm gonna try to keep it quick. Um, thanks for all the updates. Um, related to the vaccine clinics, I was reminded as I was scheduling my own children's flu vaccines that we, we can't forget about all the other vaccines that our kids are um, need to stay healthy. So I was just wondering, if you've been thinking at all about the success we've been having with these COVID vaccines, if there's any thought about potentially doing things like the flu vaccine in, in a similar way, just to help protect our, the health of our community. Yeah, we actually had a conversation this morning about that. Um, and Karen, I didn't talk today. You're not a plant. Um, but, uh, you know, we, um, the timing's getting a little bit complicated on how to do that. You know, for our flu clinic, that's primarily, we do a flu shot clinic for staff that's um, generally run by a vendor like CVS or something like that, not our nurses um, because they're in the buildings nursing, doing nursing. Uh, and also the town is really working on, you know, providing vaccine clinics like every Thursday afternoon. So capacity wise, um, gets a little bit complicated where we have a vendor in to vaccinate um, young children. So. That's sort of what we're weighing, um, and I think um, we're working on it. So we're trying to see what's possible. But we do, we are going to have a flu shot clinic for staff, and you know, based on what they're able to provide, we perhaps could open that up for uh, for children as well. But it, it's not coming directly from the town health department; it would be with through an uh, external organization. Ms. Lord, did you have your hand up, or was that no? Any other questions from the committee? I'm not seeing any. Okay. Thank you for that update, Dr. Morris. Um, and I have um, next up is our is a chair's update, and um, <clears throat> I'll try to be brief as well. Um, this morning, um, I met with a group of folks, that, including Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter, um, as well as, um, and then uh, folks from the town of Amherst to talk about budget. 
um, budget process and, and sort of get that that going. So it was um, Andy Steinberg, who's the chair of the finance, um, finance committee, and Lynn Griesmer, president of the town council, as well as Sean Mangano and Paul Bachman from the town of Amherst. So um, we talked about a few things about um, about the process for um, for going into into the upcoming year. Um, and some of those um, resonate with uh, topics that we talked about um, with another committee at another meeting. Um, but one of the, some of the things that, that came up in there was um, was really thinking through what uh, what adjustments or um, tweaks that we would uh, like to make to the the timeline and the process. And and I think the the line of thinking is very similar to sort of the, what we've been trying talking about at the at the regional level. Um, but one of the things that came up also is that um, that's motivating this is um, that some members of the uh, the current town council have expressed concern about long-term trends in our school budgets, um, particularly with regard to rising costs per pupil, um, and that we want to find a way for our process to enable and facilitate greater public understanding um, and, and sort of greater uh, open and public discussions around these concerns that have been expressed so far um, privately from the town council. Um, we also talked about um, at the suggestion that came up at another school committee meeting um, of our regional committee about the idea of having um, community forums earlier in the process. Um, and that is something, um, as well as having more sort of budget primers and explainers and complete budget books um, to explain the budget um, and bring the community into our budget process at the beginning of the process in addition to at the end um, when we get to the budget hearing, which at that point is very challenging to, to affect and impact the budget development. Um, we also talked about the, the significant impact um, that, uh, that our competitive marketplace, and Mr. Demlin constantly is, is always very good at reminding us that whenever we, when we do have conversations um, at the school committee about budget, um, and we talked about um, uh, bringing in um, our state representatives and senators um, to assist us with that in, with regard to the charter school funding um, formula. I, the other, I think the only other thing um, w related to that is that there was conversation um, about um, potentially creating a working group of elected officials to work through the understanding of budget drivers, and that's related to the first comment um, about uh, town councilors having concerns about the long-term trends in the budget. Um, so at, when we get to future agenda planning, that's a topic that, um, that we'll talk about um, the timing for that and, and putting that conversation on our Amherst School Committee, our next agenda, to talk about how we want to approach that, um, that establishing a working group and, and um, getting going on that, as well as budget forums and timelines. Any questions from the committee? Mr. Demling. Yeah, so just um, what was the desired scope or what was the discussion about desired uh, hopeful scope of, of that kind of a working group? No, it, it was really, the desired scope was really to dig into so what are the budget drivers um, for building our Amherst Elementary Schools budget? Um, what are the uh, the constraints, um, opportunities? What are um, What is the impact of declining enrollment? Um, per pupil costs, all, all of that. I, I should note also that um, that you know we, we did talk, and I think it was uh, Dr. Morris that mentioned this that that you know if the town of Amherst is is interested in funding a per pupil um, uh, cost study, um, that that's something that we'd be open to um, to have that funding. But that would be the purpose of the of the working group is to really dig into the budget and sort of look at it both. Not, not just from a current year or upcoming year planning perspective, but in terms of long-term drivers. Other questions? And as mentioned, I, I, this, is a, this is a big and meaty topic, so we will put this on a future agenda. So um, looking just for clarifying questions right now. Okay. 
Uh, next up is school committee announcements. Does anybody from the school committee have an announcement? Ms. Lord. Yes, I would like to welcome everyone and anyone to our school equity task force meeting tomorrow. First one of the year, yay, at six o'clock and it is on the district calendar. Thank you. Thank you. Just as a, um, a plug, the policy subcommittee um, met yesterday evening um, and we did use board docs for our agenda and sharing documents. So um, uh, subcommittees and um, advisory committees are, are welcome to, to use that as well. Any other announcements? Not seeing any, okay. So we'll move on to new and continuing business. And as I mentioned earlier, and I see that some people have joined and left, so I'll um, just describe briefly how we're going to go about this, this forum. And um, we'll start with a presentation um, from Dr. Morris on, um, on the pot uh, potential sixth grade move um, to the middle school, um, very brief. And then we'll allow at least an equal amount of time after that um, for for public comment um, and, and statements. Uh, statements um, should be limited to three minutes each. Um, and we ask that you raise your hand using the, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a, there's a little icon of a hand. If you click on that, that will raise your hand um, and put you in, in, the, in line. Um, and when we call on you from that line, then we'll ask you to unmute to, in order to speak for your three minutes. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Morris. Sure. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. And um, as it is a forum um, that was posted as such, I'm going to just uh, start a timer when I start presenting um, so that uh, the rules of public forum uh, in the town of Amherst now are that the public comments have to, or the public, the responses uh, during the forum have to be at least as long as the presentation. I don't think that'll be a problem tonight. I'm gonna to try to be as brief as possible. It's very similar information than what's been presented before, um, but I wanna make sure I'm following the rules on that. So I will keep track and I'll start by sharing my screen. Okay. So again, this is very similar to what's been presented. So if you are, have been watching these meetings or for the school committee members, I apologize. There, there's one slide at the end, one or two slides that are a bit adjusted, but otherwise it's it continues to be the same content. Um, so uh, very briefly, uh, uh, quite some years ago, the members of the four towns, Amherst, Leverett, Pelham, and Shutesbury requested uh, that we look at uh, a couple different models, sixth grade to the middle school being one, could seven through 12 fit in one building, uh, still full study was completed and a presentation was made to the school committee and the short relevant part of that is that sixth graders can fit within the existing middle school uh, without building an addition or anything like that based on declining enrollment that's happened in the district. Uh, as a follow-up to that there were middle school the middle school grade span advisory board was formed um, some members of that are in this meeting tonight so thank you for joining us. Uh, the group worked well right as we were hitting completion the world changed on us a bit but they did complete uh, a draft report, and I think particularly noteworthy was visiting JFK Middle School in Northampton for a tour and a conversation. We met with uh, families, met with staff members, the then principal who's since retired walked us around, uh, and it was just a really positive experience in terms of learning. You know, however people left in different places, it was it was a really powerful experience. And if we move forward, I think, uh, and COVID restrictions relax, we'd want to continue to see other middle schools with similar demographics of our group. Uh, of our of our schools, excuse me. So for me, the three primary considerations, one, you know, is this an unusual model that we don't think can work in Amherst? Second is space issues that we having, we're having currently, and the third is an MSBA uh, decision. So on the first part, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through these quite briefly um, because I've presented them multiple times before, but uh, the, it, the grade six through eight middle school is uh, the most common grade level format we have both in the state as well as in the country. Um, and, you know, within the last 30 years, many districts, I would say most districts have moved along that dimension. When we think about our MSAN districts, minority student achievement districts that have similar demographics to us and similar philosophy, uh, the vast majority of them use a six through eight model. Uh, if we look at other comparison districts within our Commonwealth, other than Brookline, you know, the, the districts we compare ourselves to frequently also use this model. 
Um, and, uh, you know, so the short story is if the school committee moves, decides to move this way, uh, I'm confident the educators and community can develop an engaging model, right? I, I don't, there's lots of models out there to view. We saw one in Northampton, we've looked at some other ones. Um, this is not moving into an unusual path. This is actually moving into a typical path where there's lots of great examples of sixth grade middle schools. And the reason many districts went that way over the last 20 or 30 years is the feeling that a two-year middle school was, was really insufficient. You know, it doesn't allow for building the relationships. It provides three tra multiple transitions within a short period of time, six to seven, then seven to eight, and then eight to nine. So two transitions in three years during adolescence uh, was a major concern for uh, many educators over time, and, and they've made that decision. Um, we got a lot of good feedback on what a model could look like on our survey, and um, again, I'm just gonna, in the interest of time, continue to, to move forward on the presentation. We do have acute space issues uh, because we moved uh, the quads and made them halvesies. We lost 12 classroom spaces at each site. Uh, and so for us, that has had many, many challenges, uh, the loss of cafeteria spaces uh, for student lunches, as well as other areas. Uh, we do have some art and music and technology teachers, actually all the technology teachers are teaching on a cart um, and some of the other specialists as well. Uh, that's, a, that's a significant challenge implication. Instrumental music, you know, we're not teaching instrumental music to third graders this year because of space. Um, and that's a really hard thing to say because uh, we know that instrumental music, much like language, is one of the things that as the earlier you start it, uh, the better you're off you are. We know that many families will get private lessons from kids that are younger, the later we start the lessons uh, the less likely it is from an equity perspective as well as just in general that our students will achieve mastery and continue in middle school and high school. But it's the, I talk multiple times or back and forth with communications from music teachers and there just isn't the space for them to, to run their program this year. And, and that's an awful uh, decision that we had to make. Uh, it's also incredibly challenging to find pull out spaces for you know, students who need it and English language learners, special education students and intervention students, um, and you know, those are uh, some of our most vulnerable learners. And while we believe in inclusion, some students do need a, se a separate setting uh, for learning, and we're struggling to provide all that they need. So these are the maps. Again, they've been presented before multiple times, so I'll skip over. The third aspect is the MSBA project decision. So I think we all acknowledge, we being the committee and myself, that we need to do something about our buildings, both Fort River and Wildwood are in poor condition, they're not getting any better, uh, more things are failing. Uh, I was over at Wildwood today working on uh, some concerns about some of the outdoor space um, and playground area, and so we're working with the town to try to look at that. Uh, and the numbers, are, the number of problems accumulate over time. So sort of every week our facilities department is trying to uh, retrofit something or fix something, and at some point that, that's gonna fail. And that's why we're in the MSBA project, because actually the MSBA has been incredibly blunt uh, about that our schools are in poor condition and need to be fixed. And that's compared to many schools in Massachusetts that fall the same way. We applied for multiple enrollment options. They only approved two. Um, so option A is 320 students, sixth grade stays in the elementary school, we stay K to six, Fort River is replaced and or renovated. And option B is to replace or replace essentially Fort River and Wildwood, whether it's new building or Advento, to one of, the, one of the existing structures and sixth grade moves. I wanna be really clear, there's a binary option. The third option is we don't, do, we don't fix our schools, right? Without the MSBA paying half the freight, we're not gonna be able to replace or repair our schools in Amherst. So there really is a forced choice here um, and it is a choice and that's what you all are considering tonight. I made a little table of the implications, uh, you know, in terms of the 320 student option, which is a K to six option. Uh, it essentially means that Wildwood would stay as is um, for quite some time. Um, that specialist teachers likely would not have their own instructional spaces, particularly Wildwood for, until Wildwood, something happened to Wildwood to improve it. Uh, when the project's completed, I'm not gonna read all of these, but I think it's important, uh, these are important points. Fort River would become a common entities only school so it means all the students in the non commonantes uh, classes, so six classes of students, grades one through six, uh, would all transition, have to go to a different school um, because there's 320 students is basically just enough for commonantes and maybe one more. Uh, it doesn't fulfill uh, all those. So that means um, a lot of Fort River, a third of Fort River would have to leave and go to a different school. I'm not sure where they'd go if we have space at the other schools anyway. 
for Riverwood run out of space, right, in several years, because it grows one grade level, one class each year with the Comandantes program. And, and we have some financial barriers to, you know, redistricting or renting mobile classrooms. Um, I think the last point's really important that the Ames and Building Blocks programs would have to move at the end of the completion. Um, that these specialized special ed programs, there wouldn't be space for them and those students would primarily not be in the Comandantes program, so they would have to move to either Cocker Farm or Wildwood. Option B, a 575 student option. The challenge, right, is why we're here tonight. Sixth grade program at arms would need to be developed and implemented and, and people have strong feelings both ways on that topic. Um, Renovation and reconstruction of both schools would be in about 2026. Uh, so it means that uh, on a positive side that both schools could be uh, offline, uh, as it were, in the next couple of years. Um, you know, we would, we would be able to do some specials um, and cafeterias and get those back sooner. Um, we would involve redistricting or renting mobile classrooms that way. The specialized special ed programs could remain uh, at, at, in the same site. Um, and that Fort River students would not have to move if they were not in part of the Comandantes program. So next steps, we're at a public forum tonight. Um, and uh, I know you're anticipating to vote um, on the next meeting on the 5th and potentially at the region on the 12th. Um, and I described some votes to work with, you know, if, if you do move this vote to move to sixth grade, which is we'd wanna work on, you know, how that works between the two districts developing a task force to you know, dig in on what sixth grade model we want, uh, work with our HR department on staffing shifts, and then explore some infrastructure improvements we've been thinking about anyway. A maker space at this building has been talked about, and uh, we have some thoughts about funding that, uh, wayfinding signage you know, in terms of where sixth graders would be situated, uh, those types of things. So here's my recommendation, uh, which I have yet to make except um, tonight. So my recommendation to you is twofold. One is a decision, and the second part is a timeline. So my recommendation is that you vote on this move on at your next meeting, uh, that sixth grade would move to the middle school. Um, you know, for me, you know, the MSVA project looms very large. Uh, I can't think of Wildwood going into the 2030s, right? They got into the MSVA program in 2013. So to wait 20 years to get, uh, to have a major improvement at Wildwood is, is just something that to me is unacceptable. Um, it's also unacceptable to pull commonantes, non commonante students and special ed programs out of uh, the school. Uh, I think just ethically, it's not something I'm very comfortable with that. Um, the current space situation is, is really challenging in our schools. I'm in them routinely and it's very, very tight and does have implications of our instruction. And I do believe there can be potential benefits. I heard some of the public comment about sixth graders do better here or there. And I think, you know, the really the question why many districts moved it is, what's better over the lifetime of the school, right? And so um, any transition year in adolescence is very challenging, whether that be sixth grade or seventh grade, but what can we provide for students in terms of a holistic education? Um, and I think that could be argued either way, but uh, I'm not convinced that one way is um, far outseeds the other. I think the other factors really contribute greatly here. And I think it can be exciting. I mean, I'll just say on a personal level, thinking about our brand new sixth grade program, what we could do, I would love to integrate world language much sooner than we typically do. I'd love to think about a maker space that we have in our plans that we're able to implement for sixth grade. Uh, so I, I see a lot of advantages. I know others have different points of view on that and I wanna respect those, but I think combined with all three of the options, the potential benefits academically and um, for our students, the space situation we have now and the building project, uh, for me, that's why I'm making that recommendation. Uh, for the timeline, I'm recommending for 20, this to happen not next fall, but the fall after. Um, you know, what I'm realizing, the first two bulleted points are, are connected there. Um, I go back to what I said in public uh, during superintendent update, excuse me. It's incredibly challenging to be working um, and teaching during a pandemic. And I think our capacity collectively to work on major projects in the same way we would if it wasn't a pandemic it, is more limited. And so having two summers is gonna be really beneficial. I go back to, uh, and I'm gonna date myself a little bit here, um, but when I was a principal at Crocker Farm and Mark's Meadow School closed and we transitioned, we had two summers to do that work. At the time, we weren't sure we needed the two summers. I will tell you right now, we needed the two summers as a principal making that transition, having that much, that much change happen. And I think this change is of a similar magnitude. Um, some might argue that point, but for me, it's, it's in that same ballpark. 
And so having this summer and then the following summer to finalize changes is really important. Some of the feedback was really helpful that I got. I know I, there was a lot of feedback received. Some was about specialized programs and making making sure that the you know, we're thinking through all the implications for every single student. And I think more time would really be beneficial for us in doing that. And on a positive front, uh, in my opinion, is that we had an unanticipated reduction in classrooms needed at Wildwood. We had two instead of three kindergartens. And that means the space needs at Wildwood are still there, but they're slightly less acute than they would be if we had a, our anticipated number of classes. So I think we can, we can this is a, maybe the wrong verb, but hobble through from an infrastructure perspective one more year of being really tight to have a better transition for students and staff uh, in, in the fall of 23. So that's where I am. I'm gonna look at my time to make sure. So I wasn't quite at 10 minutes, I was at 13 minutes, my apologies. Um, but I'm gonna stop presenting. The slides are on the board docs. So if anyone's following along and you wanna go back to something that's on here, it's on, on our uh, board docs public site. And I think at this point we can open it up for um, the public forum, unless there's, I don't know if you wanted questions from the committee first or the public forum first, Ms. McConnell. Um, I, I think uh, if I well, actually, I'll just look. I'll just scan this committee first to see if anybody has burning questions. I, I think there's um, not a lot of new information, Mr. Dem. And but um, I will also note we will um, keep the public forum open for at least 15 minutes. I think that's a nice uh, round number. Um, so as as long as it takes us to get through everybody who would like to speak, and if it's shorter than 15 minutes, then um, we'll, we'll wait um, until that, that time. Um, so Mr. Demling. Uh, yeah, real quick. Um, so on the timeline recommendation, Dr. Morris, so I don't think anybody would dispute the general notion that more planning is better and you make a compelling argument for that. But um, you know, the, for our decision, we need to balance the benefit of that against the cost of, of what you described as, as muddling through. And you know, when we first, had this topic introduced to us, the the notion of the impact of the space crunch on Fort River and Wildwood was a, a theoretical, you know, back in the spring. So now we have a few weeks of lived experience. Um, and so what what I feel like I need uh, in advance of our vote is is a better understanding of, of exactly what that that impact has been and how staff and administration is 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 handling it and and what they they feel like. The, um, the projected impact is going to be because um, I obviously don't have that and I'm not in the buildings and I'm, I'm not in a position to have that but I feel like I need that you know, it, for the cost benefit weighing um, I feel like I need that sort of bit of, of that, that data point. Yeah um, I'll just respond briefly I also see Maylene has a quick logistical comment our recorder so I want to make sure that um, I don't uh, we don't skip her um, but I think um, this is a this is a team decision we talked about it with building principles as well um, and I think we came to the conclusion that given the variables uh, that we had, um, that we felt like it was wise. And, and I don't want to, you know, it's being used, it's not a line about the pandemic. I mean, it's very real that our capacity to think about shifts uh, and major changes beyond what we're currently doing and shifting uh, just to, to provide instruction, the health and safety pieces, the time change, you know, is more limited. And, and I think you know, maybe at the next meeting, I'd be happy to ask principals to come and, and, and share their perspective. I mean, the Wildwood having one less classroom, actually, it's not a small deal. It really contributed to uh, some really helpful um, space um, pieces. It's still tight. At Fort River, Principal Hernandez came in and, and did some creative things with space, again, that we hadn't really thought of last, last spring and has kind of not found space, but found creative configuration that helped. Um, it'll get tighter next year because they will have one more section at Fort River, but I think when we when we thought about through as a team, we thought about the pluses and minuses and we sort of landed that that timing made sense. You know, we weren't comfortable going another year beyond that um, with the space needs. Um, but, you know, again, I'm happy to invite them next week so they or two weeks from now so they can uh, speak about their experiences directly. Okay. Um, so any other questions from the committee? Seeing then, um, uh, Maylene. Hi, I just wanted to note that Ford Docs does have a timer function, which I will be using. 
Um, so if you are following the meeting on the scoreboard where you can see the agenda items being highlighted, when I put in the three minute timer, it's gonna appear on that scoreboard and start to count down. Um, the one thing to note is that the timer will not have a audible noise to let you know when it's run out. So I'm gonna leave it to Chair McDonald to keep an eye on that and just let people know when their three minutes has run out. Thank you. I, I will um, I will keep an eye on that and I will note when we reach the three minute mark. Okay, so uh, just as a reminder, the little hand at the bottom of your, your screen is what you click to raise your hand in order to speak and that will put you in line. Um, and we will call on people in the order in which they appear in the queue. Um, there's, I've seen that there's some uh, comments and questions that have been coming in in chat. We'll go through the, the, the speakers first, and then um, while we're, if there's a pause at that point, then we'll um, go to the, the questions in the chat. Um, so first up is uh, Anastasia Ordonez. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Anastasia Ordonez, and I'm a resident of Amherst. I'm also the parent of a seventh grader in the regional middle school and the fifth grader at Fort River. I'm speaking today because I strongly support the moving of the sixth grade to the middle school. This move makes sense to me from an educational perspective. For years, I've heard middle school families complain about how much their children struggle to keep up in school because it's only a two year grade span. Two years is just not enough time for students to work on their critical reading and writing skills, to strengthen their math skills, and to make the transition from minimal homework in elementary school, which we've seen um, you know, for various reasons over the past few years, to the very stringent homework demands of high school. Sixth grade teachers in elementary school have to twist seventh and eighth grade curricula into a form that's usable in the elementary school setting. And information about each student's progress in sixth grade is lost by the time they get to seventh grade. In other words, there's little to no continuity once students change schools. I've also heard from parents who say they don't feel like they're a part of the middle school community because by the time they get to know a few of the parents and kids, middle school's over and everyone's moved on to high school. This is a difficult developmental period for young adolescents and they could use the expanded time in school to form stronger social connections with their teachers and school community. Also, sixth graders currently don't get to participate in the student clubs and athletics that middle schoolers do, missing out on the camaraderie and support that comes from that kind of extracurricular participation unless their families can pay for private after-school activities. Finally, and this is an important point, I think for me and a lot of other parents, we know that our town cannot afford to build a new school building without moving the sixth grade to the middle school. This is extremely important. We've been waiting 18 years to get a new school to replace our two failing elementary school buildings. To me, this is an educational and an equity issue. Many of our public school children aren't learning in healthy school environments and we can do something about that now. So let's take this necessary next step and do something about it. I've heard from teachers and long-term community members in Amherst who say that moving the sixth grade to the middle school has come up for many years in public discussion, and we keep kicking the can down the road over and over because we don't wanna make that change happen. I hope the school committee is gonna vote on October 5th to move the sixth grade to the middle school on the timeline recommended by the superintendent and our principals and educators, but that we not delay this decision any longer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is uh, Cora Fernandez Anderson. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Uh, I'm the mother of a third grader and a fifth grader at Fort River. And I want to say that I do support the move of the sixth grade because it needs to be done for the new building and so that both Wild River and Fort River can be addressed. Uh, however, I would really like the uh, school committee to think about the timing very carefully and follow what uh, Superintendent Mike Morris uh, have just expressed, that the, it, it will be a, a better way of planning and think through what are we offering, you know, the, that no sixth graders uh, to delay it to 2023 instead of like uh, 2022. 20, uh, 
Um, I believe, you know, that fifth graders have lost um, already like a year and a little bit more of in-person schooling. And many of them, you know, I've talked to other fifth grade families, feel that their children are not either, you know, academically or emotionally ready for that transition for next year. And they need the more comfortable and safe space of one more year in their elementary school to get ready for that transition. So um, I would like also to ask um, the school committee, what, what are your positions currently on the timing? Because I, I have heard in the previous meetings in general that there's large support for moving it, um, the sixth grade. And I also heard in the community there's large support, but like, what, what are your thoughts um, about the timing? Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we move on to the next one, I'll just I'll say at this right now we're we're here to do listen um, and we'll note the questions. I think the the school committee um, at at our October fifth meeting is when um, when school committee members will have the opportunity to share their own each of our own perspectives and weigh in in that discussion before we come to a vote. Um, if there's any factual or clarifying questions, um, obviously we'll answer those this evening. Um, next up is Margaret Sawyer. Hi, um, I am a mother of a student at Fort River. He is in fifth grade, just why I'm here weighing in. Um, so it's a little self-interested, but also um, very genuine. I, I wanna speak that our family is absolutely in favor of the sixth grade moving to the middle school. We think it's necessary. Um, and I'm also very strongly in favor of the timeline that Superintendent Morris has proposed. Um, we were very, very concerned that an effort to do this any faster, to do the move in the self-interested way, but also thinking more globally, to do it for next year um, would be very rushed. This is already a complicated year. We're already off to a difficult start with COVID still quite present in our lives. And it seems like there's just not enough time to get the ready for the middle school move and at the same time um, prepare the students. I was lucky to be part of planning the Caminantes project. That was really beautiful. And the school district did a great job taking the necessary time to move. Um, Right now, there's only nine months to be able to make this move if we did it for next fall, once after it's voted upon. It doesn't seem like that's enough time. At the same time, if the space needs are so overwhelming that this move really has to happen in 2022, um, I want to say that I would support some kind of a transitional year for my son's class um, of moving to the middle school building but without a lot of changes to the curriculum and staffing, if that were needed for the space, maybe they could be just sort of lifted into the middle school for that one year while more planning is done to make it good. And finally, I just wanna say that, um, you know, we moved here just as my son started kindergarten. I don't know that much about the middle school, but I've been hearing a lot of fairly negative stories and reading the responses to the survey of the, the superintendent sent out. There was a lot of reports of teachers being unhappy teaching there, students experienced that it was not a trustworthy place to be. Um, I'm alarmed to hear today that it was hard for student records to, you know, teachers to get a sense of the students from the sixth grade teachers. So I wonder if the middle school itself doesn't need a little attention and a little extra care from the school board and the, and the committee before, as this transition prepares. I wonder if um, it might be possible to spend some time just kind of loving on the middle school to get it ready for the sixth grade um, to get there. It seems like the whole place might need a little attention. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Laura Muller. Hi, uh, my name is Laura Muller. I'm a resident of Amherst and parent of a Wildwood student who actually has a question, which I'll ask in a moment. Um, Dr. Morris, you spoke of the time that the district needs to plan this uh, transition because of the pandemic, but you're neglecting the fact that children have had a lot of transitions in this time. My question is about both of those transitions. Um, the first question is from our daughter, who is a Wildwood fourth grader, who was upset upon hearing that she might move to the middle school with the sixth graders. Her question was, 
I was looking forward to being the oldest at Wildwood. There are many privileges and responsibilities that go with being the oldest kids in the school. What are they going to do so I get to do some of that stuff? So that's from my fourth grader. My question is that I want to be clear. You are asking Amherst students to go through two major transitions in two years. One in which the element, Amherst Elementary School students form community at the middle school, and then a second one when the other students from Leverett, Pelham, and Shutesbury with different demographics than our schools need to be integrated into the plan. Will you explain your plans for forming community at both of these major transitions? Thank you. Thank you. And next up is Jacob Mayfield. I believe you're still muted. We can't hear you. Um, you might be able to switch over to phone. I don't, yeah, we can't hear you. Yeah, he just, if he's still hearing, um, he was not muted, he did unmute. It just must be something with the connection to his microphone, but but the mute button is off on okay. I, I, Maybe everyone can see that, but I, I know as the host, I can see that. So okay. it was unmuted, it just, it wasn't, his voice wasn't connecting to whatever device he was on. Okay, um, why don't we continue on and um, uh, when, um, well, there's two more folks in the queue and we'll go through those and then uh, Mr. Mayfield will come back to you and see if you've been able to troubleshoot your audio. Um, so next up is, oh. Nope, we can't hear you. Um, so we'll move on to um, Ms. Uh, not sure, um, H. Um, Hanna. Hi, uh, that's me, Howard Hanna. I'm the, I'm the father of a uh, fifth grader at, uh, at Fort River and a third grader at Fort River. And so I want to say that I've, um, I reviewed the presentation uh, slides. I looked at the, uh, the data from the facilities use stuff, and it seems to me that We've that a decision is already being pushed, essentially a decision to uh, move the sixth graders to the middle school as if there's no other options. Um, uh, originally, that plan was for to move them as quickly as possible. I, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that that has changed now that it's not going to be as quick a move. Uh, but in reading the uh, the survey responses. I think many parents are still concerned with um, the, the, the community essentially dealing with COVID, uh, the school recovering from a broken 2020 school year, and the alternating start end times and, and more. And I think there are questions on, wait, uh, I think the parent questions have additional questions on planning on the middle school leadership, on this being too rushed, and common issues of middle school stuff, such as younger children being in middle school, and, and the issues being like regarding uh, behavior, drugs, vaping, et cetera. So I've reviewed that survey data, and based on the final question there, question 11, where it says like, is there any other information you'd like to share? There's nearly half of the survey respondents were against or very concerned about the move to middle school. And I think that's something to take into account because we don't see a lot of that uh, right now um, in this, in, in this uh, group meeting. Uh, but 
According to the survey, question 11, it was close to half of the people being concerned or against. Uh, personally, I think we need to consider the timing. And right now, I don't think it's terribly well planned. Uh, I think a move to the middle school is necessary. So I want to be clear about that. I think the move is necessary. I'd like the school committee to, to review the concerns raised by parents regarding middle school leadership behavior, the vaping drug use, and other concerns that were presented uh, before, um, before setting a date, before setting the date for the move to 2023. So I, be I believe we can make the move. I think we can do a good job at moving the sixth graders to middle school. Uh, I think we need to just slow it down a little bit and see a little bit better planning in place. And I believe the best interest of the students is to provide a slow, deliberate, and well-planned move. So I want to thank everybody who's here tonight, thank the school committee, and thank uh, uh, Superintendent Morris for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is Christiana Healy. Hello, I'm Christiana Healy. I'm the mother of a fifth grader and a fourth grader at, um, at Fort River. And, and for the, the reasons already outlined by the first three um, it, folks offering public comment, I'm, I'm very much in support of the move um, of sixth grade to the middle school. But really, I, I admit that I was alarmed about the move initially, at least what I heard was proposed for next fall, and that I was alarmed. <laughs> and so I appreciate that now, at least in um, Dr. Morris's recommendation, it was fall 23. And so I am very much in support, as long as you don't do it next year, as long as you wait until fall 23. And it basically means my my son won't make the move he'll be there in sixth grade at Fort river and my daughter um will already start will spend her sixth grade at the middle school and i also really like what margaret pointed out that maybe some of the concerns that parents have of their sixth grade and moving to middle school are related to issues at the middle school and perhaps it just um yeah perhaps the middle school will actually benefit from a real really thoughtful rethinking of the sixth grade at the middle school and um, whether they really are problems. Is it just something that, that parents sort of think, hear, say, or are there truly issues that that we as a community um, should address that the school committee should take a closer look at? So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and uh, Mr. Mayfield, are you Connected to sound. Okay. Now. According, uh, do I have sound now? Am I? Yes. On? Yes. Okay. Great. Don't know what happened there, but uh, thank you for the chance to speak and for giving me a second chance to speak as well. Uh, I'd like to um, to make a request, uh, a point, and then ask for a point of clarification. Uh, first, a request. Uh, I have a second grader and a fifth grader at Wildwood. Uh, we were excited for an opportunity to complete a survey and completely missed the survey because the link to the survey was buried in a newsletter. Uh, I'd like to request that the surveys go out as a separate email like all of the other SurveyMonkey surveys, surveys that we get. Uh, I think it's especially important that parents of fifth graders have an opportunity to make their voice heard about a move that would directly affect them. Uh, a point, uh, I want to make sure that it's clear that sixth graders cannot be vaccinated for COVID right now. So moving sixth, sixth graders to the middle school would mean putting them in an environment where they uh, are potentially not vaccinated, whereas the rest of the school would be vaccinated. Uh, so I applaud the idea of delaying until 2023. Uh, for that potential public health reason alone. I think it would be too soon. Uh, to assume that we can all have our kids vaccinated by then. Uh, and finally, a point of clarification. Uh, if the option A and option B for school construction are uh, binary options, does moving the sixth grade to the middle school exclude the possibility of option A? Uh, that's unclear to me. It makes it look from the slide like that would remove that as a possibility 
And if that's the case, shouldn't there be a discussion about option A versus option B before a discussion about moving to the middle school? Thank you. Um, Will Snyder. Hey, Will, I think you're muted. I apologize, but Mr. Snyder had it to be let back into the meeting. Um, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. okay. Um, well, um, I'm a, a parent of a, a uh, fourth grader who will be um, definitely part of this transition. Um, but I guess my, my concern is for the longer run too. I'd, I'd really support um, a move to uh, of the sixth grade to the middle school um, I, I kind of like the idea, especially of, of uh, languages, for example, being offered a year earlier. That's really important. Um, but I, I'd really only support it if all the elementary schools were coming in together. Um, it really um, doesn't make sense to me to um, have two waves of, of young people coming in at, um, into the middle school um, year upon year. Um, this is a, a time, um, middle school is a, a time um, when uh, community building is really important and it seems like um, a huge amount of effort would have to go into, um, into that work. I'm not sure that it, um, it would really be the best way to um, prepare our kids for, uh, for high school and beyond. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I saw a hand up and then it went down. Um, but I think, uh, oh, uh, Tony Cunningham. Hello, thank you. Um, I recognize that moving the Amherst sixth grade to the middle school is the linchpin to the building project addressing both Wildwood and Fort River. And in theory, I support it for that reason. And definitely prefer the longer timeline. I, I think 2022 is, is far too soon. But if I understand it correctly, there is no plan to change the region to be a grade six through 12 school district, and that it's likely that Leverett, Shutesbury, and Pelham would not be moving their sixth grade at the same time that Amherst would. I believe this means the Amherst sixth graders at the middle school would still be part of the elementary school district. So does that mean the regional middle school would remain a grade seven through eight school? And are there any other middle schools in a regional school district that you're aware of where only some of the towns of the region send their children to the middle school and a, a grade remains part of the elementary district? And can you talk a little bit about what the key impacts or limitations you see to the sixth grade remaining part of the elementary, elementary district? Thank you. Thanks. I think there's a, there's a, a couple of questions and actually maybe the question in the chat is also from um, uh, one of the speakers, but the question, and I think the clarification on the option A or B and um, from the MSBA project perspective. Um, so Dr. Morris, I don't know if you're able to provide some of that clarification on yeah, I was going to run down. I, I wrote a couple notes. I'm not sure I can address everybody's questions, but I think the, there, there's a bunch that I think I can, if that's okay. Yeah. So on that one, option A, which is the 320 student option, is predefined as a K-6 to option. And option two, which is 575 students, is predefined by MSBA as a K-5 to option. There's no mixing or matching. It, it, it is a binary choice um, that way. So if sixth grade stays, that defines the building project as only K to six, 320 students. And if sixth grade goes, it defines the project as K to five, 575 students only. So it, it is a binary choice that way and the grade level does, will uh, be the determining factor uh, on that, that set of choices. Um, can I just, is it okay to just keep rolling? Cause I've, I've got a, 
uh, yeah. a number of responses. So I think to Shootsbury, Leverett, and Pelham, I, I can't make a decision for Leverett and Pelham to join. Uh, it's complicated. They're members of another district. For Pelham, it's a little bit easier um, because they are members of our district. Their teachers are part of the same bargaining unit as the Amherst and regional teachers. That's not true for Shootsbury and Leverett. So it's layers of complication uh, for them to think about. So um, Pelham, I can speak to a little bit. I won't at this meeting because it's an Amherst school committee meeting, but I can at the Pelham school committee because I sit on that. I have no official role with the Leverett uh, and Shootsbury uh, elementary schools. So I uh, can't really comment much on them, except that I think they're interested in hearing what happens. But uh, I think that's as far as, you know, what we hear from Shootsbury and Leverett and the complications of them potentially sending their sixth grader from a bureaucratic and governmental and governance perspective are quite complex. Uh, I do want to note that Amherst students comprise about 79 or 80 percent of the students at the region. So when we think about perhaps Amherst only students moving in sixth grade, it's about 80 percent of the students who would be uh, coming. Um, so it, it is a lion's share. I think it's also worth noting that uh, there was a good question about uh, other districts. So actually my colleague in Shootsbury and Leverett, uh, my close colleague who's a superintendent there, has some other districts that she, uh, she's five towns, four districts. Um, and she has this exact scenario with one of her districts where uh, they send students to a sending middle school that's a sixth grade middle school and they send them in seventh grade, much in the same way that potentially some of the other towns would have. Uh, they figured out a model that works. It does involve a little bit of collaboration that way, uh, but they found it to be a successful model and hasn't really pushed them to send their sixth graders right now to the middle school in that particular community. Uh, again, another very similar model where it's a small town, uh, you know, potentially making a choice to a larger middle school where they would be in the minority of students from their member town. So there are other models out there that have been worked on in our area with people Frankly, I speak with on a routine basis, so I do feel like we have models to go from. Um, there was a comment about separate emails. You know, we tried to address this in a separate email last night, actually, that uh, I know some people would like us to send more emails, but the but major, vast majority of people are quite bothered with the number of emails we send and, and really have asked us to consolidate into a newsletter so it's predictable, reliable. You know, on Friday afternoon, you're getting a newsletter and all the details are in there. It's, it's a hard balance, I get it, um, but you know, other than health and safety or things that are building specific, like a principal search at a school, we're gonna try to stick to where the feedback we're getting, uh, which is that people are telling us it's hard to keep track of the number of emails we've sent over the past few years. Uh, in terms of sixth grade, I think you know, the model, I know there was a comment, could it be, I don't know if I got the wording right, but almost like a satellite of the elementary schools um, that's plopped into the middle school. That's something we got a lot of feedback on the survey on, and if you do move, the school committee does move forward with this. We want to get a lot of different feedback. There are sixth grade middle schools where sixth grade does operate more independently from the seventh and eighth grade middle school. There are middle schools where the sixth through eight operates as one unit. And I, I talked to a couple of people where it started as a satellite and then over time wove into a more integrated uh, model. And I actually tend to personally find uh, that a bit attractive. Um, that it's a gradual effort. It's not necessarily everything um, is done in year one. It, it works in over time. So I think, I think it's a really interesting idea. And if we do move forward, it's something we want to explore about what are the places where there might be integration, you know, maybe it's world language teachers, uh, other specials, uh, arts, music, that kind of thing. And then over time, perhaps there's more integration, perhaps sixth grade stays more as a separate entity. I don't have a solution to that, but I do think it's worth talking about uh, and, and coming to some conclusion about, you know, I know sixth grade teachers have been in touch with me a lot, and I think they're, they're very interested in the, if the transition occurs and maintaining uh, some identity as sixth grade that is distinct from middle school for a lot of the reasons we heard tonight. And, and I think that all should be considered in it. Uh, on the flip side, the seventh and eighth grade teachers often say how challenging it is to have students in a two-year environment where it's harder to build those relationships and they want, you know, more students in the building that way. So it's, um, you know, there, there's some real challenge there. Um, I think, you know, in terms of the transitions in multiple years, you know, my personal belief is making a transition from six to seven and then eight to nine is a lot of transitions uh, within a short amount of time for this age group. So I think, you know, depends how you define transitions and, and, and I get that that is something that people, folks may disagree on, but it's certainly the case that when we were in Northampton, one of the things that was really interesting speaking to families was, uh, the connection to the school over three years and how that that feels different to our wonderful PGO at the middle school. But 
it's hard by the time the PGO folks get uh, understand the school more, they're transitioning to the next group of people coming on. And it does lack that consistency that you'd want to have. So I want to acknowledge that point as being real and also that I think there's a complex set of um, factors here about what transitions occur and how to do them well. But I do think it's really important to come back to the fact that 80% of students uh, in the region come from Amherst. So when we think about other students coming in, it's not much different from at Wildwood where the transiency rate you know, is, can be upwards of 15 or 20% on a yearly basis. Just that's our school with the most transiency year to year. And somehow our students at Wildwood do really well. There's one other point I want to make is I think there's a lot of very legitimate concerns about what it what the transition would look like. And, and I referenced it before, and I didn't think about it till uh, people were saying it, but um, I remember when Mark's Meadow was closing. I remember those meetings, um, you know, frankly, that had many, many people's passions, understandably enough. They loved that school uh, there. And there were a lot of those same concerns about going to Wildwood, going to Crocker Farm, going to Fort River, because Mark's Meadow at that point was our small school, considerably smaller than the other schools. It was uh, under 200 students. Um, and they got there uh, to the other schools, and now those are the schools that people love. Um, that people don't think about in the same way. And so I do think, you know, absolutely agree that we want to put a lot of energy and resources towards the middle school. I spoke a little bit about repairing. This came back from a couple, uh, a report a while back about building a maker space and doing some wayfinding. We've put a lot of resources into painting the front hallway and sprucing up how it looks. And I do think it needs more attention. I, I completely agree with that. But also I think, you know, Kids are resilient, uh, and we would, we would support them in this transition. This involves counselors and teachers and, and folks they know and love who'd be working with them. So I don't want to minimize those concerns, but they really were reminiscent of the concerns I remember hearing 11 years ago or 12 years ago uh, when we were talking about closing an elementary school. And I wasn't in this role. I was, you know, perhaps fortunately a principal at that point. And and hearing the public comments and knowing that myself as principal of Crocker Farm was going to welcome those students that came from different schools. Uh, we worked on that transition over two summers and, you know, I'm not saying it didn't have some impact on students. Certainly it did. But I think looking back, we made that transition well for students. And I do believe that we have the capacity with the principals we have, with the leadership we have uh, to make this transition well, too, if it's where the school committee chooses to go. So sorry to wrap all that up into a long statement, but I just want to respond to a number of the very important comments that I heard tonight. Thank you. That was helpful. Um, I, I was wondering if it would be um, helpful to also uh, provide a little bit more clarity or definition around what do we mean by integration into the middle school model? Because I think that um, particularly for families that haven't yet had a student go through the current program at, at ARMS may not fully understand what that means. Um, I certainly didn't before my kids went um, went there. So it's, it's not like a high school model where kids are mixed up in courses and, and electives. Um, and I, I, so I think, and I, I see we have at least one, one teacher from the middle school here. So I'm wondering if you could spend a couple minutes and just explain what that means when we're talking about integration into a middle school model. Yeah, so um, doing the research for the Great Span Advisory Group, there's, there, there's sort of two predominant models for sixth through eight middle school. One involves the sixth graders having uh, some level of distinct program. When we visited Northampton, there was, it was a little bit hybrid, but they had different electives than the seventh and eighth grades. They, had, uh, they weren't in joint classes together, um, with the exception of some students who may want to accelerate in math if they have that option, things like that. But uh, and music, but uh, the sixth grade really maintained, frankly, what a lot of our sixth grade teachers and programming is right now. Um, so at the elementary level and most of our sixth grades and, and, and all of them in Amherst, there's some degree of kids switching classes. So um, we don't necessarily have four teachers in a grade level because our classrooms, our, our schools have two or three. Um, so a student may have one teacher for literacy and social studies, another teacher for math and science. And so that's some six, some sixth grade middle schools maintain that kind of model uh, for their sixth grade year before the full transition to a team model in seventh grade, which is most typically in our middle school follows this one teacher for math, one teacher for social studies, one teacher for science, uh, and one teacher for whatever the one I forgot of the core for core, I, I apologize. Um, so there are ways where sixth grade can be distinctly different and maintain what a lot of our sixth grades look like right now with fewer teachers and fewer changing classes. 
Uh, some middle schools have a full integration where sixth grade, the schedule is no different than seventh and eighth. They have that one teacher per content area model. And so, you know, that's again, if, if you move forward, this is where we want to hear from the community, hear from staff members uh, about what makes sense. What do we want to choose for our sixth grade model if indeed the students are in the middle school? Um, but the, the team model that you hear about has one core teacher from all the core content areas as well as special ed and, and, and ELL teacher attached. Uh, and they work as a unit. Another model, again, could be two teachers working in a smaller unit with a smaller number of students across multiple uh, content areas. And, and again, that's that's where we're open to feedback, uh, you know, and looking for the community of staff members as well as larger community of families and students to weigh in. Thank you. I think there, there's a question in the chat that um, I think we've we've answered already, but um, it could it's possible that um, that it was after or before the the individual um, joined us. So talking about um, the common uh, the impact of going to with option A on the building project, where um, it's a uh, uh, Fort River is a uh, three three hundred and twenty student K through six program and that you had mentioned that it would become exclusively Comenantes. Can you describe that again? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, you know, this is, um, it's a very awkward conversation because um, I think uh, our families at Fort River choose Comenantes or choose to not be in the Comenantes program for all sorts of good reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, for some students, and this is a particular concern of mine, uh, for English speaking students who come in in second or third grade, they're, they're placed in the non commonantes class, right? The monolingual English speaking English instruction class. So they don't really even make a choice. Um, but with the MSBA defined numbers that they gave us, we really would only have space for the commonante students in the size school that is approved if we stay in a K to six. Um, it creates many, many problems. So one of them is what do we do with students who are not in that program? How are they distributed to different schools? And it creates more space problems, especially with Wildwood being in the condition it's in. Um, I'll be honest, I don't have a great plan for how to fit more students in Wildwood right now uh, with the quads gone. Uh, I, I'm not interested in resetting up quads. Uh, I think we've learned a lot. And uh, I'd love to say that you know, the COVID piece will be done long before this is, it, you know, the more I read, the more it could be endemic. And, you know, ventilation was always important. And the fact is our classrooms are better ventilated now than they ever were before. And it's hard to go back from that uh, and put up a wall. So it, it creates lots of problems of where students go, uh, where they would be situated um, that don't have easy solutions. And, you know, it, I feel bad saying that about the, the students who are in receiving monolingual English instruction in Fort River, and also for the specialized programs, think about some of our most vulnerable kids who could no longer stay at Fort River School, and where would they land? And those students need distinct spaces uh, to support their academic and social development as well. So it, it's, um, there's not great options uh, for how to do that with a 320 student school. The other option is to just disband Comenantes, but I think we've got a commitment um, I know we have a commitment to that program and those students uh, to disband it, what, what would that do for their education as well? So, it, you know, it would be pitting side against side in, in all sorts of ways where there's no winners, in my opinion. Thank you. I don't see any other hands um, raised for the public forum. I'll give it a quick minute in case anybody has um, would like to speak um, and if not we're um, well beyond the 15 minutes uh, minimum so uh, if there are no more comments then we will move on I'll give it a quick minute I'm not seeing any. So um, with that, um, we will now end um, our public forum on this uh, sixth grade to middle school decision. Um, as I mentioned during the public comment, we um, folks are welcome to continue um, sending us email. We've received a high volume. Um, there was a very large um, amount of uh, comment in our public comment, but we've also received additional email that wasn't included in the public comments. So please continue to share your um, feedback and questions. Um, we are reading all of them. 
Um, and we'll have uh, additional public comment, of course, on our um, October 5th meeting. Um, so with that, I thank everybody for joining us this evening. Um, moving on to our next item um, is uh, in our regular school committee meeting is superintendent goals guidance. Um, and attached to that item in the agenda is a document um, that may look familiar since all of us are on another committee um, and we had a very similar document, but this is also very uh, similar to the document that we used last year. So um, Mr. Demling and I as um, vice chair and chair sort of pulled draft of this to at least start our conversation. Um, and our uh, objective for this conversation right now is to provide guidance uh, to Dr. Morris for establishing his goals um, for this school year. Um, that for folks sort of watching at home and paying attention, and just as a reminder, we set the goals for the superintendent at the beginning of the school year, and then at the end of the school year, the evaluation of the superintendent is driven by the by um, by those goals, um, and so we'll evaluate the progress on on those goals. And so tonight is um, our goal is to provide guidance for Dr. Morris in and um, building those goals. Um, so these are not the goals themselves. This is um, more sort of a, a statement of what we would like to um, see either as goals or continued work. So, um, and again, this is just a draft. This is to start the conversation. And the first page just recaps the goals that we had um, for um, Amherst as well as, as the region um, for the prior year. Um, so those are just there as reference to say sort of what what um, what what did we ask the superintendent to work on um, over the last school year. The um, second page goes into sort of what we had and as overarching guiding principles in um, in establishing the goals, um, and those we didn't really change or or revise from a year ago. So you know our hope is that wherever it's feasible um, to align our goals across the three districts so that um, the total effort is manageable and achievable within a single school year. Again, given sort of the tremendous focus and, and work and unpredictability that um, continuing to be in a pandemic year um, brings on that. The other thing too as a guiding principle is that not all of our top priorities or projects need to be defined as an individual or, or distinct goal every year. So uh, the example that we used last year was of course the expectation, performance expectation and within the scope of responsibilities of the superintendent is to manage the budget um, and in a fiscally responsible way. That doesn't necessarily mean that we need to write a goal for that particular year um, to restate sort of the job responsibilities. Um, so I don't know, it, um, I've, I've been chatting, doing all the talking. Mr. Demling, did you want to add anything um, before we go into sort of the... No, I, I think you summed it up pretty well. I think a couple of other for just practical considerations that we were thinking about is how many goals do we want to add on? Um, we've had some, um, I think, uh, good progress working with other com our, our other committees uh, to consolidate where where we can and overlap uh, um, out of acknowledgement that Dr. Morris works for three districts, um, and so so trying to do that um, and and also trying to you know define uh, find wh where the line is between what what is a major project that that we want to elevate to a goal versus you you know their their values that we um, that we expect like the budget um, to continue to have attention, but there's also, you know, individual projects as well that are time bound, um, but they may not rise to the level of a goal. So it's, there's no exact science to this, but um, so I think part of the value is just us sort of talking through how each of these are described and and what, because ultimately it's, it's, it's just a use, it's a, a tool to hone attention and effort on the superintendent's part and, and our collaboration with them. So it's really kind of up to us how we want to craft it. I won't read all of the all of the the items that are written in there because I think we can read on our own. But what obviously the the biggest big one that we think you know we've been spending a lot of time already talking about it. But the sixth grade 
um, uh, move or potential move. So um, depending, regardless of which way the vote goes, because if they if they um, if we vote not to move the sixth grade, then we will have some tremendous uh, considerations in terms of developing um, a model and with our significant space constraints. Um, the early education, continuing that work, um, and uh, budget planning and communication, um, collaborating with us um, on um, developing new approaches, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and focusing on uh, continuing to implement the anti-racism curriculum and with a focus um, on evaluating the program and reporting back. Um, and the elementary school building projects. So those were the sort of five that, um, that, that as, a, as a starting point, elevated up to um, goals perspective. And then um, the themes sort of continue on to the third page. Any um, thoughts, ads? Comments, Ms. Spitzer. Thanks. I'm going to apologize, but I've got some background noise. Um, just to be a guarantee that anytime I want to speak, that's the case. Um, <laughs> so thank you for pulling this together. Um, and so I, we're not looking for specific goals tonight. I just want to clarify, like um, we're we're looking more to generate a reaction to the the themes and the values as presented. Is that correct? Yeah, so um, the, as we would envision this process is this tonight is a discussion of what we what we would like to see in in the goals and then at our next meeting um, is when we'll look at a draft of goals that um, typically Dr. Morris will sort of take our input and turn them into into those goals for us to to consider at our next meeting. So this is more sort of stating our expectations. Great. So um, I totally agree. I am on board. I think having alignment across the districts is a great goal. And so if that means that maybe that one of my <laughs> pet goals or the thing that I feel particularly strongly about or the Emerson School Committee in particular feels strong about, like I, I would prioritize streamlining it over, over making sure that that happens. Um, I guess I'm going to just share what I feel like might be missing. And I'm not saying that these need to go on. I'm, but things that, as I'm reading this, I don't see mentioned, but I believe are values of our community. And maybe they're so obvious that they're not included because, I don't know, I'm sorry, <laughs> my screen just changed. Anyways, so, so don't take this as, take this only as like offering some suggestions on things that we might consider adding, not that they necessarily need to be added. So I feel like we've heard a lot of community feedback about responding to the climate crisis. And I know that that is something that is a town-wide effort. Um, so potentially, um, you know, maybe doesn't need to rise to the level of being on the goals, but I think it could rise to the, val to the level of being one of our values and something that we might specifically add to, to our values around. Um, and I could see it intersecting in some ways with increasing outdoor, education engagement with the environment engagement with like the garden projects like I, I don't think it has to be you know just um, technical solutions to reducing our carbon footprint I think it could also be broader in terms of raising students awareness and I think we're doing a lot of that work now so that's why I'm saying I, I think just calling it out as a value and a priority might be worthy of doing it um, I I am also and this kind of intersects with a conversation we're having and a concern I have about what I'm hearing is that unfortunately because of a lot of the changes we've made due to COVID we've lost potentially some of the arts education um, in terms of and also related to budget cuts I, I think we're still doing a great job but it, it worries me that like third grade third graders may not be having access to, to music um, instrumental music next year in the way that um, we have in the past. So I, I could see that as either, you know, maybe specifically planning about how to kind of address that gap for some of our kids or how to try to um, use the arts in a way to help, you know, as I think, I think 
um, Ms. Lord has mentioned this in the past, you know, arts as a, as a way of healing, you know, some of the trauma related to COVID is something else I'd like to just call out. Um, and then also we talk about wellness, I, it, and I think this is broad enough, but I, I would just call it like I could see integrating kind of like physical, like movement and, you know, in there a little bit. We, we call out social, emotional, and they're clearly connected very strongly to you, like your physical well-being is connected to your mental health it's all it's all interconnected but maybe just calling that out specifically and then i guess the final thing is if, if there were one thing and i don't think it's not important but i think i feel frustrated in our inability to actually move the needle on this a bit is is the early education piece so i i think it's really important as a mother <laughs> with three small kids who i've struggled to find um, early education options. If I think if if the superintendent's feeling like that's not something where we actually have the ability to have much of an impact, then I, I would um, be in favor of potentially um, de-emphasizing that in, in, in the future. So those are my reactions to this. Um, thanks for pulling it together. Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button. Dr. Morris. If it's okay to respond to a couple of the things Ms. Fitzer said. So I think on the environmental and climate justice piece, I think you make a really compelling point. And, and I think here's where I struggle. So not that you need to be the holder of my struggles, but, but I think it's worth, worth mentioning because I think it's where we struggle is, all right, so we know we're in a building project. We know the outcome of the building project, whatever it is, will be incredibly more efficient than what we have now. What we have now is a really inefficient buildings and they've only gotten more so with, you know, how we've changed them for COVID. We have these large buildings with very few classrooms, right? Like that's, you know, not the way you would design energy efficient buildings. So I'm glad we, I'm glad we did what we did. It's keeping our kids, you know, as safe as possible in the current context. I don't regret it. So there's that piece. And then we get to, you know, like electric vehicles and some of the other pieces. So I can remember earlier about this. And, and I do think where perhaps we're not moving as much as we want is how does this connect to the larger term vision of environmental justice that the town has? Um, you know, we are a department of the town, you know, in a different way than the region, you know, perhaps is. And whether that's a goal for me or whether it's a goal for the committee, um, you know, there is, you know, town government does have a specific sub, I'm going to hopefully it's a subcommittee, but I don't know if it's, I, I get mixed up in the town, uh, how the town government functions that way, but they have a group focusing on on this very item and, and perhaps we need to take a look at that and see what are things that we can do uh, to contribute. You know, we, we have a lot of real estate in town. You think of these three, you know, relatively large elementary schools, we use a lot of energy, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, with two of them perhaps, you know, having, you know, not a forever shelf life, so to speak, uh, you know, there, there may be some limits there, but at Crocker Farm, for instance, are there things that we can be doing to think about it? But, you know, I think, you know, we, we keep doing these incremental things. Rupert and his department are fabulous at continuing to make us as energy efficient as possible. But I think it is worth, you know, contemplating, you know, what are things, how do we work with the town on a larger vision? Because the towns that are, the school districts that are doing this well are doing it in conjunction with their municipality. You know, that, that, that it's not something separate that the schools do that's, sort of divorced from the work of the town. So, you know, whether that's my goal, great. If that's, you know, our goal collaboratively as a district, that, that's a different way to think about it. But I'm really glad you raised that because in the midst of all this other stuff, we can easily forget the climate crisis that's happening around us. So, um, and, and we all have a role to play in that, right? Um, I think on the other point on the early childhood center, I think what, what's hard for me to contemplate right now is, you know, we, we have expanded the preschool spaces, but space is such at a premium that I think even conversations about space that seemed more doable two years ago uh, when we had quads at the elementary level seemed very difficult to sort of enact right now. So whether that's working more with the town and what's possible with Head Start, um, but you know, in terms of what I'd love to do, my vision would be hosting, you know, I'd love to have younger students, not just preschool age students, but actually younger students, like I'd love it to be that community feel. Um, I don't see how that works anytime soon, um, separate even from COVID pieces, just literally in terms of space. Um, so, you know, how you all want to factor that in and how I write a goal is fine, but I think I just want to acknowledge that point that um, we all can have visions, even if I could fund these things, you know, I can't fund the spaces to go along with them at the moment. So, sorry for a long-winded response, but I thought those were just really valid points that I wanted to uh, respond to. Thank you, Carrie. Other thoughts? 
Mr. Demling. Um, so yeah, so I really like the comments. Um, you know, the, the, the climate thing, I, I, I don't know whether it, it should be a goal, but I do, I almost think it's a overlap for something that we haven't discussed on our committee yet, which is committee goals, where the, where the school committee d d defines um, strategic directions or goals for the district, and then we, we take that on to, to focus. Because one thing about the, the climate stuff is, and I, I think about the electric buses a lot, where, um, you know, electric buses are this very evocative thing, right, where people will see it, ooh, electric bus, and we get emails about, do the electric bus. Um, but in terms of if you had a fixed, if we have a fixed amount of capital, which we do, uh, and you want to most efficiently decrease your carbon footprint, where's the best bang for your buck? And it's not in electric buses. <laughs> like if, if, if all we had was, um, was just pe more people taking the bus, our, our, our current fossil fuel buses, that would, that would do way, way more for, for reducing the carbon footprint. So that's just one little example. So, so then that, that really begs the question for me, okay, well, in all of our, our, our operations and in the way in, in which we, we do business and deliver our, our services, well, where, it, where are our, where's the lowest hanging fruit for reducing our carbon for, for footprint, right? We, we can't invest billions and billions in, in, in energy efficiency, but if, if we have X number of dollars, where, where can we get that? So that we're not just reacting and, and feeling motivated to do like performative things, like, oh, look, we put up a solar panel array in this parking lot or, or the, the things that are very visible but might not be the most efficient. Like, I don't know how to answer the question, what's the most practically efficient bang for your buck way to invest? I would love to, whether that's partnering with the town or something, I would, I would love to, to have that highlighted so that we don't lose track of that. Um, I think Dr. Morris raises a good thing about um, the pre-K. Um, I, I also don't want to lose sight of that. Um, uh, on, uh, and, and yet, you know, as we sort of, um, highlighted at the end of this this discussion on on pre K last spring, you know the, the school's pre K mission is is special ed three to five year olds, um, which is very important. But it's it's that that's a subset of of every student under kindergarten age level that needs some kind of support and service, and families that need support and service for that. Um, and that's a broader question that is way beyond the budget and scope of the schools. And yet, if the community is really going to make progressive uh, movement on this, I would imagine the superintendent would be at the table, right? And you you would think that 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 our 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 community learning leader would would be there. So I don't know, um, really. And this is what's difficult for me in terms of how how we proceed as to whether we we make that a, a goal and say, okay, Dr. Morris, just get it done. <laughs> um, you know, you know, pull together whoever you think you need to, or, or whether it's you know collaborate and establish a, some kind of a process. So that's where I I kind of um. Uh, struggle there, um, and I'm glad we're not defining the the goals tonight because I'm realizing I have more questions <laughs> to answers. So the third the third goal I wanted to comment on was the the elementary building project. You know, obviously, um, once that uh, gets going with the designers, going to have a lot of attention. Dr. Morris will be actively involved in that, and and yet it's it's a little it's somewhat complicated, right, in terms of who's driving the bus of certain pieces at different stages, right? There's the school committee that that ultimately approves. Right, and owns the education plan. There's the elementary school uh, building committee that makes certain decisions. Um, there's there's the town council that will make a decision. There's the public that will make a decision. And Dr. Morris is sort of, you know, um, it, intersecting at those different stages. So I I don't want to sort of say get the building project done as a goal, right? Without um, and 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 expecting leadership uh, or involvement in certain pieces where it's not. His role and that he's, you know, feeling uncomfortable, like he's stepping on toes or whatever. So, um, you know, I, I, I would, I would appreciate Dr. Morris sort of taking, just thinking about that uh, in advance of the next goals draft, about what will be the best, um, best way to do that. Other thoughts. I have some, but I'm going to bite my tongue for a little while longer. <laughs> okay, I'll give, I'll give you some airspace. Um, I, I, it's an interesting conversation because I think um, uh, with the early education and um, it, it sort of connects into um, a theme that, that you see sort of just tacked on at the end of this, which is sort of tying these to sort of what is our, 
what, what is our overall mission and, and sort of our longer term beyond a, a single school year goal, um, whether it's our school committee goals um, and, and, and sort of values as a school committee or as, as a district. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that, that, that I think about and, and, and the early education one sort of pops in my head because that was one we, we've had it now for two years in a row as as a superintendent goal. Um, and because of COVID, we haven't actually been able to sort of get it over the line as it was originally written, um, which which did envision sort of including it or considering it in budget. And I think, um, you know, with with COVID and sort of the, the other um, Complications, so it's, as Dr. Moore spelled it, spelled out with space. It's it's not just a money issue. It's a it's a, a infrastructure which is obviously related to money. Um, but it really gets at sort of how do we think about these goals as they connect over year over year, as opposed to being like one and done kind of kind of objectives in a, in a single year, um, which just like true confessions. The only reason I think the the biggest motivating reason to include it in the goal was simply just to, as, as I think Mr. Demling was just getting at, is just like tie it up and like finish what we started. But I'm not even sure where it's clear to us what what needs to be finished at this point. So I, I would be in favor of of including that more in sort of the themes of sort of how do we keep that in mind. I love the way you painted that picture, Dr. Morris, of this of this this grand community sort of of all ages and and sort of just keeping that as sort of maybe a guiding light to inform um both the elementary school budget uh, building project as well as uh, some of the other considerations that might actually be in in our in our um plans and, and just sort of keeping that as a theme i like that approach um and i and i think sort of with regard to um you know, you know, in in terms of thinking about the goals, is and um, you know, for the goals for this individual year, and sort of go back to our school improvement plans for each each of the schools. That was, I think, that was probably two years ago at this point, maybe two and a half years ago when we were trying to work through those, and I think we never finished it because COVID hit. Um, but just sort of connecting and sort of being like reaching back to that and thinking about these these topics or these projects that we've outlined here as potential goals and how they might be contributing to or connecting to some of the the, the objectives and goals that that had been outlined in those school improvement plans i think that that is a way to sort of pull the thread all the way through across multiple years um and i and i think you know with that the climate um crisis I, I i do really like including that and i and, and infusing that I, I you know the obvious places in that elementary school building project work to keep that as a consideration but i think you know when it comes to sort of the budget and the capital planning that's another area that i think we can definitely um weave weave that in and thinking about um how we're spending our budget and where we're and what we're thinking in terms of what we're prioritizing in our capital planning So I, I just spoke a long time, um, Mr. Harrington or Ms. Laura, do you have anything that you want to add to the conversation on goals? It's perfectly okay to say plus one. <laughs> Great. Um, any, any other sort of thoughts from the committee um, on this? Not seeing any. Um, Dr. Morris, did you have any questions for us? Maybe just next steps would be at the meeting, I guess, on the fifth. Uh, I would plan to bring draft goals for your consideration, get feedback, and then potentially be voted at the the following meeting after that. Would that be the structure process piece? Yeah. Okay. I think I think I've got good uh, good information to take a take a stab at it, and then get some more feedback before they get finalized. Thank you. Thanks. Um, moving on, our next item is a uh, student enrollment data, um, including Cominantis. And there's a, a document presentation attached to this agenda item. Uh, 
And I will turn it over to Dr. Morris too. Sure, um, and this can be, uh, well, as brief as you all want it to be, but it's just a simple plot of our students in the three schools by grade levels. Um, you can see our preschool um, is up to 55 students that'll continue to grow. Uh, that's uh, about 20 students, a little more than 20 students more than we had last year, uh, because last year we didn't have typical peers with us uh, in our preschool program. Um, and when students turn three, if they have disabilities, then they can come to school, so that number will grow. It's been great seeing the, pre so, Selfishly, I just I should I want to plug it. Uh, they have a new name. It's the Early Child Early Education Center at Crocker Farm. Um, they're trying to they did some rebranding and new logo. Um, gosh, it's just great to see the kids outside, you know. And thank goodness that playground was built out. Um, thanks for all the town of Amherst. Uh, they're spending a lot of time outside, but you know it's just it's been delightful to go down on my Crocker Farm and see the students and to see more students than we were able to have last year. So I want to thank the preschool staff. I know they often understandably feel like, you know, sort of an appendage to the school. I mean, literally it's at the end of it, uh, but their work is no less critical than anyone else's work to the success of our students uh, and their time here. Um, so you can see that we have a, a big jump there and across the rest of the district, um, uh, a bit more students last year, you know, on October 1st, which were really close to that date, we had 1,029 students in our schools in Amherst and now we're up to 1,055. Again, the bulk of those being uh, preschool um, students who are enrolled. You can also see, and it relates a bit to the conversation earlier, although I didn't want to point it out. Um, oh, yeah, sure. It is on the board docs, but um, Ms. Spitzer makes a good point. I should be able to share this. Um, so that people can look on. Um, uh, I think the other point uh, worth making is that there was a request from the school committee to have an update on the Comandante's enrollment, and you could see uh, this has actually changed with one new student, I want to say today, uh, coming to us. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's relative to the district. It's held, you know, relatively constantly. We started in the neighborhood of 38, 39, and uh, we've lost some. We've gained some as students come in, particularly bilingual students, and that's been, or monolingual Spanish students at times, as well as bilingual students, and that's been a fabulous entry for students, um, so that's worked remarkably well. Um, so when I look at the enrollments, uh, the other thing I wanna note is we see a pretty big drop from fifth grade to fourth grade. So not, while not a primary reason to perhaps wait a year for an earlier topic, it is notable that there'd be about 20 less students um, if fourth grade, the current fourth grade is the grade to transition up to sixth grade in two years. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not an insignificant number of fewer students uh, than the fifth grade at 157. We have had some give and take. There's more students in certain grade levels and less in others, and some of that's predictable, right? So there's more delta between last year to this year uh, than in a typical year, and we sort of talked about that last year and knew that was likely to be the case, uh, that we'll, we'd see more uh, differences. Uh, fresh grade got, and some of our schools got quite a bit bigger. We know that some students stayed in the a daycare program for, for kindergarten because it was predictable, reliable, and it was the you know the kind of first stretch of of COVID. So that's sort of where we're sitting at the moment. Really interesting thing is how the school totals are almost identical. Uh, that's that's a change. So if you look at the delta between Wildwood, which is right now, including if you include the preschool, our smallest school, um, and but all three schools are very, very similar number of students in them. Just a very interesting fact that it, it waxes and wanes in ways that, you know, demographers don't seem to ever get right, you know, when we have these studies done. Uh, I think Amherst has less predictability than many communities, and I think that's an we have an artifact of that. But also, Fort Rivers gotten larger because of the Comandantes program. So out of that 353 students, uh, and there's double digits of those students who are slated for Crocker Farmer Wild, but but don't attend there because they're choosing to attend the Comandantes program. So that intentional decision the school committee made uh, has also kind of leveled off some of the differences in enrollment uh, that we have. So. So it was just worth noting those pieces um, and open to any feedback or questions uh, from the committee. Mr. Demling. Uh, so thank you for putting this together. Um, so obviously that 32 number of Crocker Farm kindergarten cohort stands out. It's the smallest graded cohort um, on, on the map there and it um, quite, a, quite a bit lower than the next grade above it. Um, and you know, we were all concerned about: uh, Are we going to have uh, a drop in enrollment with with people coming back from COVID? So, do we do we have any initial speculation 
um, about about that cause there, other than just our general, um, you know, evidenceless uh, speculation, and and kind of related to that, do you know when we'll get our first look at um, charter school numbers? Because um, that that could have a, a pretty significant impact if on our budget planning, if 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 a lot of this is is that. Yep. So on the first front, uh, we saw a lot of transiency in every direction. You know, uh, over the last eighteen months, um, we've had seen students come, we've seen students go, we've had students come come to our district who've lived in Amherst their whole lives, but um, came to the schools for the first time, and we've seen students depart, and we've seen lots of families depart for other communities. I mean, I think you know, national trends around uh, people um, changing roles, perhaps changing towns during a demographic during the pandemic. I think we realized that here. In terms of charter schools, our school attending report generally is collected. Uh, that information is collected usually in December, you know, so we're relying on local, um, not just charter schools, but private schools and schools of choice. Um, the October 1 date gets settled, and that's where we get our numbers. Uh, after that date, we start hearing from, and supplying too, because we have choice students as well, uh, the information um, that all goes through uh, a report that has to be filed with the state, um, and that usually December is our timeline on that, so we don't have a, a great handle on specific, on that specific um, question, but as we get it, we'll bring it back to the committee, and it certainly would have an impact on many, many factors, including financial. Any other questions? No? Okay. Um, so next up, we have um, agenda plan future meeting agenda planning. Um, and as mentioned, our next meeting is October fifth. Um, that on that agenda is the continuation of our conversation on this uh, possible move of sixth grade to the middle school um, with an anticipated vote um, on that decision on that evening. Um, we'll also, as just mentioned, um, have a, a first look at draft goals for the superintendent um, and also fourth quarter budget, which would be fourth quarter of the prior year. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> FY21. I think the other thing that um, we'll add to that agenda is um, what I referenced in, the, in, in my update is a conversation about how we want to um, approach our process for budget development this year. Um, building on some of the conversations and, and uh, ideas that, that we generated at another school committee, um, you know, how much of that do we want to bring into uh, into this school committee, as well as um, understanding the input and feedback that we received um, from the town council. Other topics, Mr. Demling. So I don't think we need this as a regular, like called out agenda item, but. Um, uh, but, but we're always getting some level of feedback and the pandemic continues to evolve. And so um, if, if we could make it like a regular part of the superintendent's update, just to briefly touch on um, status of COVID in the schools and um, in our, you know, our, our layered mitigation strategies, for lack of a better term, and, and how that's all going. Um, I just feel funny sometimes uh, if, the, if I have a specific question about, uh, uh, I don't know, how something is being implemented. Um, but but you didn't happen to mention it in the superintendent's update. I don't want to you know um, break break scope of, of agenda there. So um, but it, but uh, on the other hand, it, it's probably too cumbersome to add an entire agenda item to review COVID stuff when if it's, if it's just going to be the same thing. So um, is that is that something you think that would be workable, Dr. Morris? Or? Yeah, I, I don't mind having it as a, a semi regular. Same way that we should have the school building committee updates. Sometimes it's going to be more. Sometimes it's going to be less. But if we always have it then, you know, the update is things are going really well. We haven't had many new cases, no school-based spread. 
that's the update. I think everyone's going to be okay with that. And if there's more to there, like either the vaccines come out and we're talking about our how we're going to try to work with families, or if things turn for the worse, you know, it seems like a good placeholder. Um, so I don't mind actually having it on the agenda because it allows for more discussion from the committee, whereas superintendent update would be a little limiting, I think, for the point you raised. I don't know how others feel about that, but. That works. Okay. Um, well, there there is time. So if any any sort of aha moment occurs between now and um, the week before the fifth, um, uh, shoot me an email, um, and um, we can talk about getting that on the agenda. Um, next up is uh, warrant reports, and I have a couple because we tackled so many at that last meeting. Um, I don't have as many tonight. I have three. Um, I, Allison McDonald, authorized payroll in the amount of $727,167.29, um, dated September 8th, 2021, and I signed that on September 3rd, 2021. I, Allison McDonald, signed uh, authorized payroll. Um, the, oh, uh, forgot about this one. Um, payroll in the amount of negative 4,886, dated July 28th, 2021, and I signed that on September 3rd, 2021. And last. I, Allison McDonald, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $331,331.56 for a warrant dated September 1st, 2021. This includes general fund expenses of $157,551.35. Um, um, there's an extra digit there, so that's why I hesitate. Um, revolving fund expenses of $27,000. Seventy dollars and twenty-eight cents. Forty-six uh, grant fund expenses of forty-six thousand six hundred and seventy dollars and fifty-seven cents. Gift of one thousand two hundred and forty dollars and fifty-nine cents. Article thirteen in the amount of six thousand two hundred and twenty-two dollars and thirty-nine cents. And Article twenty funds of ninety-two thousand six hundred and twelve dollars and thirty-eight cents. And I signed that on September fourteenth, twenty twenty-one. And that is all. And next up, we have um, gifts. There are some gifts attached to. Uh, we have uh, new gifts, previously sent gifts, um, and a grant. Ms. Spitzer. I'm happy to make a motion. Um, I move that the Amherst School Committee accept the following gifts from Rafaela and Paul Vigiard. Apologies for mispronunciation. Um, uh, Vigard. Can you say it again? Vigard. Vigard. Thank you. Um, in the. <laughs> I'm going to start again. I move that the Amherst School Committee accept the following gifts from Raf Rafaela and Paul Vigard, number 7226, to support the Susan Vigard Camp Scholarship in the amount of $200, from Mary Ellen McCarthy, um, assuming it's revocable trust in number 671, to support the Susan Vigard, Vigard Camp Scholarship in the amount of $100 from Felice Diaz Arango in the amount uh, to support the Susan Bigard Camp Scholarship in the amount of $100. And for Marta Moselle, a Yamaha model number 6345G professional trumpet with case and accessories with an estimated value of $12,000. For a total of $400, um, 
I um, would like to amend uh, that motion. The the trumpet has an estimated value of twelve hundred dollars. It looks like. <laughs> Sorry, did I say twelve? It's getting late. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. I'll second the motion with the amendment. And we'll take a vote. Um, actually, well, we'll just stay on this one since we've already moved on that. Um, uh, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Ms. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, so I see I need to make another motion. So I move that the Ember School Committee accept the following gifts from Stop and Shop A plus rewards to support Crocker Farm at the principal's discretion in the amount of $502.84. In addition, from Martha Oliver, number 996079, to support Crocker Farm at the principal's discretion in the amount of $10 for a total of $512.84. Second. Um, I'm not sure. Am I looking at a, there's a, there's the page I'm looking at dated September 15th has a lot more on that than just those two. And I made a mistake. I, I the AMH pre gifts previously sent had two pages and I only read the gifts on the first page and I neglected okay. to read the ones dated August 13th. So. Okay. That's the error, sorry. Okay, sorry, I made that mistake too. <laughs> um, uh, I'll second that. Any discussion? Seeing none, um, we'll roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. And I'm gonna close that so I don't get confused again. <laughs> Um, I will move that the Amherst School Committee accept the following gifts from Michael Wick, MD, number 212, to support the Wildwood Susan V. Gard Camp Scholarship in the amount of $300 from Anita Pellis and George Pellis, number 673, to support Wildwood uh, Susan V. Gard Camp Scholarship in the amount of $20 from Judith Becker Healy, number 1585, to support the Wildwood Susan V. Gard Camp Scholarship in the amount of $50 from Elizabeth Gulliver Cash um, to support Wildwood Susan V. Gard Camp Scholarship in the amount of $10 from Anonymous Cash to support Wildwood Susan V. Gard Camp Scholarship in the amount of $20 from Sarah and Chris Owen to support the Wildwood Susan V. Gard Camp Scholarship in the amount of $25 from Soleil Sonoda, number 159 to support the Susan V. Gard Camp Scholarship in the amount of $50 from Howard Sonoda, number 6355, to support Wildwood Susan V. Gard Camp Scholarship in the amount of $100, from Elisa Melnick, number 1308, to support the Wildwood Susan V. Gard Camp Scholarship in the amount of $150, from the Wildwood PGO, number 995094, to support Wildwood at principal discretion in the amount of $750, and from Martha Olver, number 996, to support Crocker Farm at principal discretion in the amount of $10, total gift amount of $1,485. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, seconded by Spitzer. Roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. And we have two grants. Um, I'll move that we accept the following grants um, from Amherst Education Foundation to support garden learning and ethnic studies using outdoor spaces to decolonize the curriculum in the amount of $3,795 from Amherst Education Foundation to support playground picture communication board in the amount of $3,200 for a total grant amount of $6,995. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, seconded by Spitzer. And a roll call vote, Mr. Demling? 
Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously. And um, thank you to all of our generous gift givers and to the Amherst Education Foundation. And would anybody like to make a motion? I move to adjourn the Amherst School Committee. Second. <laughs> Just trying to change it up so it's not always McDonald's and Spitzer <laughs> making these motions. <laughs> and I also want to note that we are exactly two and a half hours. Nice job, everybody. Um, so there's no discussion on, on this motion. Um, we'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. Um, we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Good night.